Hey everyone, welcome to Pulp Hero Audio. So, I've been debating for a while exactly what I wanted to accomplish with this channel. Uh, at first, I thought, well, you know, just do some audio recordings of different pulp stories, you know, Conan the Barbarian, that kind of thing. Uh, expect a lot of Conan, okay? Uh, he's probably my favorite, although I do enjoy others of the genre. Uh, Conan kind of uh, is, is king of the mountain, so to speak. Uh, so, done a couple of audio recordings of a couple of the original Robert E. Howard stories, uh, which are in the public domain. Uh, the Tower of the Elephant and The Frost Giant's Daughter is what I have up right now. Uh, so you can always check those out if you just want to listen to uh, the story as the author, Robert E. Howard, presented it. But then I decided, you know, perhaps I could do more with this channel. Um, you know, talk about some things related to these characters and, and this genre and that kind of thing. Uh, may go back to some of the audio recordings of the stories and things again, but want to try and branch out, do some other things. So, anyway, for this particular video or recording, whatever you want to call it, um, I wanted to get into some commentary of Howard's Conan stories. Now, if you are familiar at all with Howard's method of writing the Conan stories, um, he did not write them in chronological order. Uh, instead, he just presented different parts of Conan's life at different phases, different times in his life. And so you'd read one story, and then the next story might take place, you know, years earlier or later than you, the one you read before. So as a result, there's been, you know, numerous attempts throughout the years to put them in some kind of chronological order. Uh, I'm a big fan of chronology. Uh, I love chronologies. Uh, now, I don't claim to be any kind of Howardian scholar or anything like that, but, you know, I can still, you know, read these things and, and put forth my own ideas. But like I was saying, I, I like chronologies. I, I like kind of knowing the order in which things happened. And I've looked at several different chronologies. Um, by far the one that... I find the most appealing, the one that seems the most well thought out, uh, at least to me, is uh, the one called the Dark Storm Chronology, uh, which is the chronology that was uh, roughly, basically followed by the Dark Horse uh, Conan comics, which uh, sadly Dark Horse no longer has the license to the Conan comics, so we're not going to get to see Conan's life progress chron chronologically speaking in that way, as once again the license is back in the hands of Marvel Comics. Might do a whole whole different video on that some other time. Uh, the Dark Horse comics uh, really mean a lot to me. Um, around 2003 or so, when Dark Horse obtained the Conan license and they started their comic series, uh, that was really what introduced me to the original Robert E. Howard version of the character. Now, of course, I'd seen the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies like most people had. Uh, I very clearly remember seeing all of those uh, great painted uh, tour paperback novels, you know, that were published in the 80s and 90s, you know, they were all over the place, uh, bookstores, uh, libraries, and I was always drawn to and, and 
those covers, you know, they, they looked really cool, you know, especially to, you know, a kid and all of that, you know, the, the muscle bound barbarian warrior wielding his sword against monsters and, you know, and good looking women and that kind of thing. But I really didn't read much of any of those, uh, Tor novels back then, because again, you know, they were all over the place. There, there were so many of them, and, and I always wonder, well, well, where am I supposed to start? And of course, you know, with, with Conan, it really doesn't matter where you start. Uh, that's kind of the beauty of the character. You can pretty much pick up any story, any book, and, and you know, just kind of jump right into whatever he happens to be doing at that point in his life. So I kind of avoided some of those. And of course, they weren't written by Howard himself anyway. Uh, but with the Dark Horse series, you know, I started reading those comics and, you know, and they really seemed to push the idea that they were going back to, you know, the, the original spirit of the character uh, as done by Robert E. Howard, which naturally made me want to read the original Robert E. Howard Conan stories. Well, fortunately, it seems that Conan had a bit of a renaissance or something around that time period uh, because there were some great uh, editions of the Howard stories put out in multiple volumes allowing for someone to you know, pick them up and read them. Uh, you could read them in the order in which he wrote them, uh, the order in which they're published, uh, which is how they're presented in the books. And so I read them that way. And But then I also started looking at these chronologies, and because you could tell that the Dark Horse comics were following some kind of chronology. So I, I read them in that fashion as well, uh, going by, again, the uh, Darkstorm chronology, which, again, is the chronology that I seem to uh, be drawn to the most. I think it seems very well thought out and logical. So, with that in mind, uh, going by that particular chronology, the first Robert E. Howard Conan story written as far as the earliest phase of Conan's life would be The Frost Giant's Daughter. Okay, so, <laughs> Took me a long time to get there, but here we are to The Frost Giant's Daughter. Um, in this video, uh, I'm going to talk about that story in particular. Uh, but one of the things that jumped out at, jumped out at me about that story... Uh, as well as, you know, comparing it to a couple of Howard's other early Conan stories, is, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the theology, uh, the, 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 the beliefs, if you will, uh, of Conan the Barbarian. Of course, we're dealing with a, you know, polytheistic, uh, pagan-type societies, that kind of thing. So you've got these different beliefs and gods and goddesses and so on and so forth. Um, so I know we're talking mostly about the Frost Giant's daughter, but I'm going to also bring in a couple of other early Howard tales uh, into this discussion. Uh, the Tower of the Elephant and the Phoenix on the Sword. Uh, in the Tower of the Elephant, uh, Conan pretty much outlines uh, his god, uh, Krom, uh, the, the Sumerian god. Uh, we see in the Tower of the Elephant, he doesn't seem to have a great deal of respect for some of the more organized religions of the cities and civilization, because he says in Tower of the Elephant, uh, and I'm, I'm reading, I'm quoting here, he says, his gods are simple and understandable. Krom was their chief, and he lived on a great mountain, whence he sent forth dooms and death. It was useless to call on Krom, because he was a gloomy, savage god, and he hated weaklings. But he gave a man courage at birth, and the will and might to kill his enemies. 
which in the Sumerian's mind was all any god should be expected to do. So there we get the idea that Krom is not uh, the most benevolent of gods, uh, just you know, up there on his mountain, sending forth dooms and deaths. Yes, at birth, according to the Sumerian belief, uh, he does you know provide a couple of things: uh, courage, will, you know that kind of thing. But then you're pretty much on your own after that. I mean, it, it's it, it's all on you. Uh, don't don't expect any help or intervention or blessings or anything like that from Krom. And at this point in Conan's life, uh, he seems to be, you know, pretty cool with that. He seems to feel that, as he says, you know, that that was all any god should be expected to do. He seems satisfied with, you know, this religion of his, this, this god. Okay, so did he always feel that way? Is, is kind of where I'm going to here. Because if you go by the Dark Storm chronology, um, the Tower of the Elephant takes place after the Frost Giant's daughter, and long before, years before, the Phoenix on the Sword, which is when Conan is now older and a king, and incidentally is also the first published Conan story. Okay, so if we take that in mind, uh, I'll jump now to the Phoenix on the Sword. And here, uh, Conan is having a conversation with another character named uh, Prospero. And they are discussing some of the, the tribes and people uh, of the northern lands that Prospero is unfamiliar with, uh, which would also include uh Conan's Sumerians. Um, it says in the Phoenix on the Sword, uh, they're talking about a map that Conan is adding some more details to about the northern lands, uh, Samaria where he was born, uh, Asgard and Vanaheim being a couple of others. And Conan, it says here, Conan says, Conan grins savagely, involuntarily touching the scars on his dark face. You have known otherwise had you spent your youth on the northern frontiers of Samaria. Asgard lies to the north and Vanaheim to the northwest of Samaria, and there is continual war along the borders. Okay, so this was Conan's youth, and I think that's what lends itself to the idea that the Frost Giant's daughter is going to be very early in Conan's life, you know, when he's still quite young, you know, just shortly after leaving Samaria. And then Prospero asks a question. He says, what manner of men are these northern folk? And Conan describes them, uh, tall and fair and blue-eyed, which would, again, go along with the description of the characters that Conan is dealing with in The Frost Giant's Daughter. Uh, their god is Ymir. Okay, again, we'll see that in The Frost Giant's Daughter as well, because Ymir, their god, he is the Frost Giant. Uh, the Frost Giant and each tribe has its own king. They are wayward and fierce. They fight all day and drink ale and roar their wild songs at night. Okay, so a pretty, you know, boisterous, you know, living life type of people. And then Prospero n notices a similarity between those people and Conan, because he says, Then I think you are like them, laughed Prospero. You laugh greatly, drink deep, and bellow good songs. Though I never saw another Sumerian who drank aught but water, or who ever laughed, or ever sang save to chant dismal dirges. So we find here Conan is unusual for a Sumerian. Okay, uh... The, the Sumerians, as Conan's about to describe, they live in a gloomy land. Uh, based on what he tells us in the Tower of the Elephant, they believe in a gloomy god. So it's sort of natural that the Sumerians would be a gloomy people. So already we're seeing Conan is counter to his own culture. I mean, even though he may show respect for Krom in the Tower of the Elephant, he is very counter 
uh, to the Sumerian way of life, uh, which may, you know, lend some clues to why he left Samaria. Uh, it, it just didn't sit with him. There, there, was, there was something in Conan uh, where this wasn't good enough. Uh, I guess he didn't want to uh, live in Samaria and drink aught but water and never laugh and do nothing but chant dismal dirges for the rest of his life. So, the Sumerians have a gloomy god, they have a gloomy life, they have a gloomy land, because Conan then says, uh, perhaps it's the land they live in, answered the king, a gloomier land never was, all of hills darkly wooded, under skies nearly always gray, with winds moaning drearily down the valleys. Okay, so they live in a gloomy land, they have a gloomy god, they live a gloomy life. And we're going to find that not only do they have all that, they also believe in a gloomy afterlife. Because Conan goes on to say, They have no hope here or hereafter, answered Conan. Their gods are Krom and his dark race, who rule over a sunless place of everlasting mist, which is the world of the dead. All right. So, if you are a Sumerian... You are born into a gloomy land. You are taught to believe in a gloomy God. You live a gloomy, dismal life. And then when you die, you go to a gloomy, dismal afterlife, world of the dead. And clearly, this did not entirely appeal to Conan. Uh, so he left, right? Okay, And then in The Phoenix on the Sword, I think the next statement he makes is, is interesting. This, because he says, The ways of the Asir were more to my liking. Okay, so when he encountered the Asir, uh, got in with them, he found their way of life more to his liking than his own native Samaria. And notice, here we are, you know, closer to the end of Conan's life. He's a king now, and he's voicing this, that the ways of the Asir were more to his liking. And, and it's interesting the way he phrases things about the Sumerians. He says, perhaps it's the land they live in, not perhaps it's the land we lived in. He says, their gods are Krom, not our gods are Krom. Okay? Because in the Tower of the Elephant, it says, his gods, speaking of Conan. Okay? So in the Tower of the Elephant, Krom was his god. Now in the Phoenix on the Sword, many, many years later, it's their gods. Okay? So maybe Conan still has some respect for Krom. I don't know exactly. Uh, but based on this, it would seem that throughout Conan's life, he has had some different ideas about his own philosophy, theology, that kind of thing. Which brings me to the Frost Giant's daughter is where I want to go to next. Okay, so if, if the Darkstorm chronology is correct, and I tend to think it is, uh, after leaving Samaria... Uh, the Frost Giant's Daughter is kind of the next uh, Howard-written story uh, that would fall into the timeline. So in The Frost Giant's Daughter, we have Conan on a field of battle. Again, he's, uh, he's met up with or, or joined in uh, with some warriors of Asgard. And they are battling warriors from Vanaheim. And after this bloody battle, the only two warriors left standing are Conan and uh, this, this Vanaheim warrior, uh, Heimdall. And so they're standing there facing each other, and uh, Heimdall says to Conan, in the Frost Giant's Daughter, Man, said he, tell me your name so that my brothers in Vanaheim may know who was the last of Wolfhir's band to fall before the sword of Heimdall. And then notice what Conan says. 
Not in Vanaheim, growled the black-haired warrior, but in Valhalla will you tell your brothers that you met Conan of Samaria. Okay, so, Valhalla. Um, Conan is talking about Valhalla. And that Heimdall can tell his brothers uh, when he goes to Valhalla that he met Conan of Samaria. Now, at this point, if Conan were to fall on the field of battle, uh, it makes me wonder, what, what does Conan think? Uh, is Since he is fighting in these people's land, uh, you know, could he gain entrance to Valhalla? Or is he still expecting uh, the gloomy, dismal uh, world of the dead ruled by Krom? I don't know. But he says in the Phoenix on the Sword, in, in the Phoenix on the Sword, that he found the ways of the Asir more to his liking. Okay, so even if Conan never entirely abandoned Krom, as we can see, he still does, you know, respect Krom uh, in the Tower of the Elephant. But still, yet it does seem that Conan was a bit drawn to this religion, this idea of the, the afterlife and the ways of life of uh, these, these other northern people, of, of the Asir, uh, which is kind of interesting to me. You know, in, in, this, in this polytheistic, uh, pagan-type, you know, culture, you know, is Conan bound by the land of his birth? Or, you know, could, could he have, you know, converted, you might say. Uh, so here, in The Frost Giant's Daughter, he's talking about, you know, Valhalla as if it's a place, you know, that, that he, you know, believes in. You know, he, he talks about, you know, Heimdall going to Valhalla. And in The Frost Giant's Daughter, you know, he, he basically meets an actual god. You know, he, he meets... Adelai, he, he meets the Frost Giant's daughter, as well as a couple of uh, the Frost Giant's sons as well, uh, that he slays. So Conan has this interesting reaction, or I'm sorry, this interesting encounter with uh, these, these god or demigod type figures of the, of the Asir, and something tells me that that really stuck, stuck with him, uh, throughout his life, because later in The Frost Giant's Daughter, after his encounter with uh, Adelai, with The Frost Giant's Daughter, and he's talking to the other warriors who find him, he says, it's interesting, the, 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 uh, the almost contradiction here, he says, by Krom, okay, you know, e evoking the name of his own god, which I imagine was, you know, pretty common to his speech patterns, he says, by Krom, Niord, gasped the Sumerian, am I alive or are we all dead and in Valhalla? So, even Conan seems to think that perhaps not this gloomy, dismal underworld awaits him, uh, but perhaps Valhalla awaits him. Okay? Uh, now, this is Conan as a very young man, and I think he has been very influenced by uh, these Asir and their culture, their society, their beliefs. And I think that stuck with him throughout his entire life because we see him many, many years later in the Phoenix on the Sword and he seems so distant in many ways from the land of his birth, yet he still speaks you know, almost reverently of the Asir and their ways. So it's almost like Conan, in a way, was kind of a, a quasi-convert, maybe, to, uh, to uh, the, the beliefs of the Asir. I don't know, but I, I think it's interesting. Uh, but then in the Tower of the Elephant, you know, he seems, you know, very sternly Sumerian. You know, he's talking about Krom, and, you know, there's no mention of the Asir or Valhalla or anything like that. You know, it's just, you know, 
the, these are his gods, Krom, and so on. So, makes you wonder what happened between the Frost Giant's daughter and the Tower of the Elephant for him to kind of uh, regress back into uh, the more traditional Sumerian way of thinking. Uh, of course, Howard did not write tales of that particular time period uh, so much. But again, I think we can make some speculations because based on what Howard did tell us, and again, if we go by the Dark Storm chronology that I'm following, uh, at some point after the events of the Frost Giant's Daughter, uh, Conan came to be a captive of the Hyperboreans, uh, whom he kind of bore a hatred for for the rest of his life. So makes me wonder, uh, after these positive experiences with uh, the, the Asir and Valhalla and their god and, and so on, uh, maybe the events that took place in Hyperborea, the things that he suffered there in captivity, uh, the, the things he dealt with among the lands of the Hyperboreans, maybe that soured him a bit on some of the ideas and the beliefs of the North. So by the time he makes his way to Zamora and we see the events of the Tower of the Elephant, uh, he is sort of, you know, retreated back into the familiar, uh, the things that, that are comfortable to him, uh, that being Krom. But then, many, many years later, as we see in the Phoenix of the Sword, he's now a king and that kind of thing. And, you know, reflecting back, it, it's almost like in a way maybe he's come full circle and he's once again uh, entertaining or at least speaking fondly of, so showing maybe even a bit of nostalgia uh, for his time among the Asir and the way they lived and what he learned among them. Uh, so I just think it's uh, an interesting thought, you know. Uh, Conan, you know, we typically think, oh, he's he, he's uh, unfortunately there are those out there that oh, Conan, he's kind of a dumb brute barbarian, you know. But but no, uh, there there's there there's deeper things in the mind of Conan, and it just makes me wonder how his philosophy, uh, his his theology, what have you, how that could have. Uh, fluctuated and changed uh, throughout the years of his life. Uh, so I've, I've rambled on for quite a bit. So uh, the last thing I want to address about the Frost Giant's daughter is probably the most controversial aspect of it, which is uh, the fact that essentially Conan is... Uh, I don't know, uh, attempting some kind of sexual assault up on uh, Adelai, the Frost Giant's daughter, uh, which is entirely inconsistent with the character of Conan that we see in all of his other stories. You know, Conan did not force himself upon women. You know, that was that was not the way Conan did things. He Oh, he, he could be forward, but you know he never forced anyone. You know, every all of his interactions with women we see uh, appear to be entirely consensual. Uh, so in this particular case, I don't think Conan can be blamed for what goes on here because, as it's described to us, this is what Adelaide does. Uh, I do think there is something magical, supernatural, otherworldly going on here. You know, Conan is a mortal man, and she is basically using her, her powers. I don't think it's simply uh, a matter of a man lusting after a woman or anything like that. In this case, she is deliberately uh, messing with his mind, you might say. Uh, because he, 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 he's not himself here, you know, and, and when he kind of comes to his senses, you know, he even, he even sort of talks about it that way, how that, you know, it's, it, it just, 
he, it was like he just couldn't help himself, uh, you know, and we find that, you know, that that's exactly what Adelaide does. I mean, she, she is out there for the purpose to lure, uh, warriors to their death, you know, to, to bring them to her brothers so that they can slay them and lay their, their smoking hearts on the board of their father. Uh, so again, if, if you, if you read the story, uh, I think it becomes very clear that, you know, Conan is not entirely in control of his own actions throughout this story. So whatever he attempted to do here, uh, I do not think that that is Conan's fault. And, and we do not see Conan behave in this manner in other stories. You know, he, he, he does not attempt to force himself upon women or anything like that. So the idea that, you know, Conan is, you know, attempting sexual assault or something like that, uh, I, I think Conan is, is, is not guilty in this case if you actually read the story. Okay, guys, well, I've rambled on long enough, and so I'm going to stop there. I hope you enjoyed these thoughts on the Frost Giant's daughter and some of the, the theology of Conan, if you will. Like I said, I don't claim to be any kind of uh, great scholar or anything like that. Uh, I'm just going by what I read and, you know, little things that, that jump in my head as I read and compare some of these stories to each other. All right, so that's it for now. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.